Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final day of the Great Grow Along. I'm super excited that you could be here with us on Spring Equinox. It means so much. It's all sunny from here on out. My name is Lamanda Joy. I'm going to host your community garden panel. I'm also one of the co-creators of the Great Grow Along, and I hope you've had a great time these last 10 days. Yes, 10 days full of all sorts of education. If you haven't been able to catch everything, please join us for On Demand. You can find some info about that on your screen where you can sign up. Before we get started, I would like to thank Gardening Know How, our media sponsor for The Great Grow Along. But not only have they been our media sponsor, but they have had a dedication for many, many years to community, community gardens across not only the US, but Canada, across the continent. So I would like to thank them for all of their hard work supporting community gardens. And today we have five of the recipients of their scholarships to talk about their amazing programs. So I'm gonna start out by introducing some of these great people, and then we're gonna take some time and talk about the great work that they're doing, helping diverse communities across the continent. First, I'd like to start off with Jeffrey Johnson. He's the founder, he's from Savannah, Georgia, and he is the founder of the Charles Henry Chapman Memorial Community Garden Restoration Project. Now, this is part of a fraternity at a historically black university, and the project is named after the fraternity's founder, and it restores vacant city lots to flourishing public gardens as a gift to the community and provides educational opportunities to kids. We're going to get back to Jeffrey in just a second to learn more about what he's doing. But next up, I have Collie Turner, founder of the Her Heroic Gardens with a focus on helping veterans experience the healing powers of gardening. Also, you have your great new program, Mission Windowsill, which I uh, am happy for you to share about in just a few minutes. So thank you for joining us. We have Tanina Williams, Indigenous edu Educator in Pemberton, BC. So hello to Canada. Uh, this is Healing Through Harvest Garden and part of an Indigenous Ways Knowing and Being program connected with the goals of Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Very powerful work. Excited to hear about that. Finally, we have Allison DeFory, Executive Director out of Gloucester, Massachusetts of Backyard Growers that are gardens established in a community with a wide variety of immigrant populations and speaking many different, different languages. So that's our panel for today. I'm really excited. We're gonna go ahead and get started and ask some questions about the formation of these amazing community gardens. So the first question, and I'm gonna throw it off to Jeffrey first and we can go around. Um, what was the impetus for starting this garden and how does your garden project serve the community and what need does it fill? Okay, um, first of all, thank you for having me today. Um, really, really quick story about how this all happened. Um, one summer when I was in fifth grade, my mother bought me some tomato plants, to keep me busy. It worked, they flourished, I grew some tomatoes, everything seemed all good. Fast forward a few years into adulthood, my mother has since passed away and I took a greater impact, a greater role, I should say, into the nutrition that I was putting in my body. And so from that, I built a backyard garden and I, everything was all organic, soil, seeds, fertilizer, I put everything down. First year, by the way. So I emptied entire seed packets into the ground and grew absolutely nothing. And I mean nothing. So... <laughs> I started, yeah. So I started a compost bin and I had some uh, some church members and friends that would give me things for my compost bin. And someone said, hey, there's a school up the street that has a school garden. You should go help. I said, all right, cool, no problem, I'll go help. And I went and they considered me this garden expert. Now remember, I grew nothing that summer, nothing, absolutely nothing. But I did not want to be embarrassed in front of the kids. So I put in the work and the research to getting that done. And I just got my hands into this. And so um, our fraternity had a plot of land by the nearby college that was a nightclub back in the 70s, which meant there were bottles everywhere. <laughs> Every time I dug in the ground, there was a bottle. And I mean whole bottles, not just glass shards, whole bottles of things I've never heard of. So that prompted me to say, hey, let's cut the grass down. Let's get everything going. Let's start with some raised beds. And the kids across the street came over and they started helping me. And from that, um, I, I told the brothers in the organization and we got some seed money, no pun intended. 
And I was able to build, build and build from that. And here we are now, um, almost four years later with several raised beds and we've been able to feed several families in that neighborhood and the local community. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Let's go ahead and um, talk with, um, I'll look at my notes. Polly, why don't you tell us about your program? Sure. So Heroic Garden started um, in 2018. So like Jeffrey, a, a little, uh, we're in our fourth year. Um, and we really, our, our entire mission is to help veterans experience the healing power of plants and nature. Um, when we started out, we were working with individual veterans um, to help them transform their properties. So not a landscaping company, but uh, we were there to actually help with transformation. We can help heal the land. And in doing so, we would help heal the person. Um, but what happened over time was this um, waterfall of you know, the veteran community finding out what we were doing because all of our services are um, free to veterans that qualify. And uh, within the city of Philadelphia, there was a um, apartment complex called Edison 64, which was named for Edison High School, which uh, the building had fallen into ruin. The high school itself had moved down the street. And um, Edison 64 was built through um, the city and um, housing, federal housing. And it, it actually was uh, memorialized for the 64 uh, young men that went to fight in Vietnam and never returned. And uh, that was the largest number of um, men killed um, in the country at that time. So uh, they've memorialized uh, these gentlemen and it is a, a beautifully restored um, apartment building that um, veterans live in and uh, but it's you know it's in the middle of North Philadelphia and they had maybe one tiny strip of um, grass um, so for us it was you know people started hearing about us uh, the service organizations that were involved with Edison 64 said hey you know we'd really love it if there was a way we could build a garden now, knowing that a lot of the folks that live at Edison 64 are, you know, we're like many of us, we're not uh, as young as we thought we used to be. So uh, what we did was, you know, outside of securing a champion in the building, um, we went to a local contractor and we said, listen, we really need some raised beds. We have a lot of folks that, you know, bending over isn't, isn't that great, um, but they want to participate. So um, last year, we were able to not only build um, eight beds, raised beds and, and stair beds, um, we were able to install um, all kinds of vegetables, herbs, pollinator plants. And we did this as uh, a series of classes in social therapeutic horticulture with the veteran population. And they were already used to us because we were working with them virtually. Um, using plants and plant-based activities. So, um, you know, for us, the, even, even the idea of, yes, planting and harvesting and then cleaning the garden. And now, you know, as I was telling you earlier, Lamanda, we're getting ready on April 21st to actually clean up the garden. All of these tasks that, and that all of us know this, um, are all part of our healing and our hearts being open. And it's no different with the veteran community, especially because, you know, the minute that veterans went to boot camp, they stopped being civilians. So for us, um, you know, this garden has been uh, transformative for the veterans that, that live there. Um, being able to go out and cut some salad for dinner is, is huge. Um, and it's really snowballed into uh, something quite fantastic because um, people are taking notice in other states and uh, we're hoping to expand uh, into New Jersey. Tell us a little bit about your windowsill program while we're at it. Sure. So, um, you know, with COVID, we, we were doing live um, social therapeutic horticulture classes and then COVID hit. So um, we took about a month off and we thought, OK, just like we're doing right now, if we, you know, if a veteran has access to a camera and an Internet, uh, we could mail kits um, or we could hand deliver them. However, and uh, we started socializing the idea in Philadelphia and um, it worked. 
So every other week we would get on a Zoom call. Um, kits would be delivered the day of to the veteran and it would either be live plants or plant-based material. Um, the leader would be a registered horticultural therapist and we would do these little five week programs every other week um, and they would have a pull through, right? We might start with a pizza garden. So what are we doing? Um, you know, what are we actually planting? And it could be just the idea of propagation, right? Just getting your hands in the soil. Um, and what we started to notice was a lot of change in social behavior. We had a lot of veterans that, um, you know, they were immunocompromised, right? They weren't going anywhere. Um, they were isolated. All of a sudden, we have people talking about how fun it is. Oh, I remember, you know, my grandparents had a garden. And that's exactly what we're trying to do, get people out of their, um, their daily thought process. So um, as a result, um, we're happy to say that this will be the year that we're actually taking the program nationally. We have a lot of response within the veteran community in other states. And because we're virtual, um, we're going to go for it. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Sure. All right. Uh, Tavina Williams, would you tell us about your program in Pemberton, BC? And tell us a little bit about the impetus for starting it. Who does the garden? Who does it serve? Yeah, just uh, so you know that I'm in, I'm First Nations. My nation is Little White Nation. And it was, it was a really interesting thing. So uh, one of the parents, she's a really big part of PAC, and she... Um, she was like, Kenina, I have this idea. And I'm like, she tells me about, it. I'm like, I've been thinking of the same things. You know, like, wouldn't it be amazing if each classroom, we have, I think we have 18 divisions right now in a school, so that's grades. And um, each classroom had a raised bed. And they learned the whole process of, you know, you know, you know, growing, starting their little seeds and stuff like that in class and then plant, you know, and, and preparing the soil and all and, and learning about that, you know, because you can learn so many different things like science and stuff like that about, you know, plants and everything. So it, it starts, you start kind of going, oh, okay, this is how it can work. And then what does that look like from an Indigenous perspective, you know, and so and I'm like, well, we cultivated plants here and we grew plants. And, um, the, you know, so one of the barriers that we have is that because Indigenous people are a secret, you know, in our country, that we just need, um, we need to make us uh, our ways of knowing and being, uh, you know, put it out there and show everybody we're no different than any other people. And so, you know, that cultivation and taking care of and being empowered by, you know, the food. And our area is, I mean, like anywhere in the earth, you know, plants can grow, right? And so what are the best plants here? And so I started naming all kinds of plants that we cultivated in our area, uh, potatoes and rice and onions and, you know, things that grew really well here. And actually Pemberton is well known for their potatoes their potatoes. And so the soil is perfect for potato growing. And then, and then the other part was, what are some plants that we can grow that are um, also for spiritual practices? And then this is so then I was like, well, we could grow sage, we could grow uh, sweet grass. So now we're showing the economy of indigenous people because sage doesn't grow in this area. And sweet grass doesn't grow in this area, right? Like it's not a natural plant here. And that shows how far we spread out, you know, to trade for these spiritual plants. And then also lavender and things like that. So you'll see in our garden, you'll see that there's um, a center rock piece. And that's where we put the, um, the spiritual plants. And then every then there's the other plants on the outside and and it's so cool because the kids take care of their their one box the classroom takes care of the whole process and they you know at the end of the season they make sure they they close up their box and then in the spring they re-enter it you know and so they're learning the whole process because the other thing that we get in our area we're really close to Whistler 
uh, Whistler, BC, which is a uh, you know, big resort, a ski resort. So we have a lot of people that come to this place to live that ski life. But then what do we do? They don't, what, they don't really, they haven't grown up in this place. So then they're learning how to be stewards of this place. That's really amazing. Thank you. Allison, would you please tell us what was the impetus for starting uh, Backyard Growers with your immigrant communities? And uh, tell, us, tell us the need that you feel. Sure. So I'm not the founder of Backyard Growers. I'm the newly transitioning in executive director, okay. but okay. I did um, begin working with Backyard Growers the year that they founded, which was 2010, when our founder, Lara Lepianca, turned her one tenth of an acre um, yard into a mini farm in downtown Gloucester, the city that we're in, and just decided to learn about gardening. She hadn't really been doing much gardening before that. And it inspired community building in her neighborhood. And soon, sure enough, like lots of neighbors were asking her for advice and help. And I was involved uh, at the time I was working with another gardening agriculture organization and teamed up with her to help on the install of those initial gardens. So that was, you know, now 12 years ago. So fast forward, I know, <laughs> fast forward in Backyard Growers uh, continues to serve the community in Gloucester. We work with school children. So we serve 100% um, of kindergarten through seventh grade students in Gloucester Public Schools. It's something like just over 2000 students with gardens in their schools. We also work with the housing authority neighborhoods um, and also partner organizations, our local food pantry and uh, action shelter and a few other different organizations. So we we serve the community uh, in, a, in a bunch of different populations there, but most of our work right now is with children between the ages of, or the grades of kindergarten through seventh grade. And we have um, uh, the, a model for how we work with the schools that is really great because, you know, all of our public school teachers are like so overtaxed now. And the trick that we've found is, you know, coming up with a program that doesn't create more work for teachers and, and trying to come up with a system where like a school garden program isn't totally contingent upon like one, one teacher and that teacher leaves and the program leaves. And so what we do is we have a couple different um, trademark programs of ours, salad days and fall harvest days, where each grade working in their gardens comes out in the spring and they plant a spring crop. Um, if they come back in June before school gets out and they harvest that and it's served in the in their school cafeteria, that's our salad day program. Also, when they're planting in the spring, they plant a fall crop, but they come back in the school year and harvest. And so for each grade, it's a little bit different. And what they get out of it is a little bit different because they're at a different developmental stage. So something that's really cool right now is that we're, we're having students that have done this every year since kindergarten because we're we've been around for 12 years, you know? And so we've, we've got this generation of students in Gloucester that, um, are harvesting every year. And so we do work with the immigrant population in Gloucester, uh, mostly through our community gardens. And then of course, immigrant children in our schools as well. Um, we have a few different community gardens. Again, some of them are at uh, housing authority neighborhoods. Some of them are in like our local parks. We have one at the elderly uh, senior center. Um, yeah, we work with the community in a bunch of different ways. Amazing, thank you. Well, you know, we have a diverse group of uh, gardens and people that work on gardens, founders, people that have become stepped in, you know, down the road as executive directors. I think it's really important. I myself as a founder of a nonprofit related to community gardening called Peterson Garden Project in Chicago. And I think, um, you know, one of the really key things about a community garden is that community word, because otherwise it's just a giant garden that or a program that you can't take care of. So I'd like to shift the conversation a little bit and talk about, you know, for those of you that, you know, have inherited a garden or you're building the program over, you know, four years or however long the duration is, how do you engage the community so it's not all landing on you, right? Like, a, you know, a great idea starts it, but then you really need the buy-in from everybody else. So how do you engage the community, encourage them, encourage volunteers, empower them to make it their project as well? Jeffrey, would you like to start? Sure. Um, <clears throat> for me, the, the easiest thing, and it's, it's crazy the way it happened, was I started with the kids. 
the neighborhood kids would come over every day I was out there and start helping me. And eventually you see people, neighbors just pass by, pass by. And eventually those pass by became looks. Then the looks became honks. Then the honks became, hey, let me step out and see what you're doing. So for me, it gave me an opportunity to interact with that neighborhood, with that community. And not only do we, we do give them the food, but I save seeds. So when the plants grow big enough and I get into my saving seed process, excuse me, my seed saving process, I also distribute the seeds to the neighbors in the community. And so if something goes wrong and they said, hey, someone was out here looking at your stuff, it's this and that. So I'll become like a staple in that, that neighborhood um, just by people seeing me out there consistently. At first, I was out there a good five to six days a week, like winter, spring, summer, and fall. And so for me, consistency was the basis for everything to grow from that point. Have, have you noticed it's sort of become a ground zero and that other like more home gardeners, like more gardens are happening sort of concentrically around it? Well, I think what happened was everybody was doing, they were gardening, but they were doing their own thing and no one interacted with anybody else. So now someone to come by and say, hey, my cabbage isn't doing well, or my watermelon isn't doing well, or my broccoli isn't doing, and I'm noticing like every time I turn around, somebody is growing something somewhere. And if, hey, I heard that you have seeds. Yeah, I've got the seeds here. You can have these seeds, whatever anybody needs, um, we're trying to be there to provide for them in whatever way we can. That's amazing. I love, I love, <laughs> just, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Um, let's see, would, whoop, we got too many trackpads going on here. Um, Kali, would you like to answer that question next? Like, how do you build that support structure so it's not all landing on yeah. know, becoming a huge program and not enough people to do it? Yeah, um, it's for us, it was identifying um, community partners within the city of Philadelphia that wanted to make an impact in the city limits um, and recognize that veterans are a really important if not one of the most important assets we have in the country. Um, and so we have been overwhelmed with volunteers, um, not only wanting to um, help with the project and help expand the, the garden areas, uh, but also get to know the veteran community. And what's I think very magical about this is, and I'm sure everyone sees this as, you know, the, the age group of the volunteers are um, in their 20s and early 30s, and the veterans are Vietnam. Um, you know, they're, they're not necessarily um, Desert Storm. Um, they're, they're older, and Vietnam veterans in particular are, um, are very forgotten. And um, so we're seeing this, these new friendships um, and, you know, just two people, I, I often stop and photograph people, um, they're just, they're weeding together. And they had no other connection until the minute that they walked into that garden. And I think, you know, Jeffrey, just like you, you know, we are, we, this garden is, um, is in a, an urban neighborhood there that does not have um, a grocery store close by. Um, and in fact, all around the garden, of course, we've got high fences and barbed wire, but um, I, I, bring, I bring up your story because that's exactly what's happening in the neighborhood is all of a sudden there's this soft, beautiful green space. We've added, you know, Adirondack chairs. People go out there and, and sit in, in the garden space that was really, you know, before those Adirondacks were in the parking lot. Um, so... Our intention is to, uh, we have a contracting partner um, and to build more, right? Because we've got the space, uh, let's continue going. We've got um, our rain barrels going um, and just continue as long as, you know, we can inspire the veteran community to say, these are our gardens and we are consistent and they know that we're coming uh, to teach and to learn from them. Amazing, thank you. Janina, how did you build your support network to get your amazing school garden program going? Well, you know, we have such a lovely community at Pemberton. Uh, it's a smaller community, so 
you know, we're not in a big city. We're we're right in the mountains in BC, and like I said, there's tons of farm farms here that grow, you know, staples like potatoes and carrots and things, that root things, and then of course other things like strawberries. But you know, those are the main things. And so there, it is. There is a really grounded, well grounded, growing community here. But like I said, there's a lot of transient people that come in. And uh, not just from you know Canada, but from all over the world. So they're coming here, and you know they're trying. They don't know each other, and they don't know the community, and the community doesn't know them. And so this is a really good opportunity to connect each other because you know, you know, it's such a beautiful pro it's such a beautiful way to do it because you can get to know somebody in a quiet way. And, you know, cause some, not everybody's like outspoken, right? And not everybody's able to do that, but you start coming together and it brings, and so one of the things that brought, definitely brought us together was that we need, um, we have a lot of wildlife here. And so um, <laughs> a deer came into the garden. We didn't have a fence. A deer came in and uh, proceeded to eat everything in the middle of the night. And so, so then all of a sudden we're like, we need a fence, <laughs> you know, and, you know, I mean, funding goes pretty far, but, but it goes further if um, the labor comes from people and my partner, um, she's one of these dynamic ladies who just knows everybody and her husband's a doctor in the community, you know, so they, they already have a connection to her, you know, oh, I know doctor you know, so and so and then they're like, Oh, that's his wife, you know, so it's that helps. And she just puts it out on Facebook or different media sources and says, Hey, we need help with uh, building this fence, you know, because the deer came in and ate, um, ate everything. <laughs> so it was like we were starting at ground zero again, and all of a sudden, you know, all the work that the kids put into it and the community was like, we can't have the kids disappointed <laughs> with this, right. So I think that heart piece is so important because then their parents are like oh yeah how do we how do we save this and farms from our community donated lots of stuff to refill those things and then people came together and helped build the fence and there was just multiple layers there and then also you know other things as well that's a great story thank you thank you so much allison what are you experiencing in terms of building the community yeah. to support your program. Similar to Tanina, I, I love that story. I'm sad to hear about the deer eating everything, but like what a universal <laughs> gardening experience, right? Um, you know, Backyard Growers has incredible community partnerships. Like since day one, Backyard Gar Growers has partnered with really like key players in the community. So we, for example, we work with a local farm to start our plants in their greenhouse. Um, we work with another local farm to get food to supplement what our little gardens are growing at the schools when it's served in the cafeteria so that we have enough for all the students. We have a garden at the local food pantry and that food goes into their soup kitchen and then also the store that they have, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We have these like incredible partnerships that I think also give us credibility in the community as well. Um, and in, a, in kind of like along those lines, we, we also really rely on our base of community gardeners. I mean, of course we work with volunteers, but we have cultivated this group of community gardeners who are really invested. You know, they're invested in their specific garden plot and then the greater community garden that they're a part of and then our organization as well. And, you know, I think that we do that um, through kind of both meeting people where they're at and then also requiring a little bit of them. You know, we have trainings that we ask that our gardeners please attend so that they're, they've invested their time. Um, we do seed giveaways and seed sales and things like that, but we're really looking for it to be mutually beneficial um, and, and mutual investment. And so we, we, I think we have the benefit of now at this point, we've been around for about 12 years and we have a good reputation in the community because of this sort of strong like foundation of just working with our neighbors and partnering with really solid organizations and um, kind of building that credibility over the years. And at this point, we're able to leverage that. Like we have wait lists for our gardens and 
the um, gardeners that we work with like are truly really invested. Um, but again, I think there's that like meeting folks where they're at, like not asking too much or not asking like the wrong type of thing. And then also really working with them to grow, um, you know, grow things that make sense. Cause I think everyone's had those community gardeners that are like really enthusiastic <laughs> and that's awesome. And you want to harness that in certain ways, right? But you don't want people like to have a bad experience. You don't want things to fail too much or, them to grow so much that there's nowhere for that food to go or, or whatever it may be. And so it's kind of this mix of like working with other folks in the community and providing the right amount of resources and asking for, um, you know, investment from the folks that we are working with as well. That's great. Well, you know, just a couple of comments and I might, I might veer off a little bit from what we originally talked about in the Zoom room, but, um, you know, I believe that community, I believe the world's a better place with more gardeners in it, right? Like I've never met a gardener I didn't like. And I also feel that gardens, gardening and community gardens in particular, they're the great common denominator, you know, like the sun <laughs> beats down on all of us, the rain falls on us, the squirrels eat our stuff. You know, it's like something that we can all relate to in a very simple, heartfelt, you know, meaningful way. And I feel, you know, now with political climates in the world crazy that community gardens are, you know, more important than ever so we can share our humanity with each other. So I think that's super important. And I love to see just the magic that happens, you know, like Jeffrey was out there gardening and then people came and asked questions and then, you know, it turns into something because community gardens allow people to share who they are with others. And I think that's amazing. Anyway, tangent aside, what my question is now is, we want our gardeners to succeed, you know, and sometimes we have those brand new gardeners that have a four by eight plot and they come in with 90 plants, you know, <laughs> like we don't want to bum them out because they're, you know, going to jam it all in there and not going to work. So how have you uh, tackled um, educating people? You know, what sort of programs have you offered or, you know, classes or what have you? How do you do that in uh, a way that is meaningful to the communities that you're working with? Jeffrey, would you like to start with that? With a trick question. <laughs> um, sorry, my connection was un unstable for like the last mm, oh, minute. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, but everybody got quiet and looked at me, so I'm assuming it was directed at me. <laughs> okay, well then we'll 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 start we'll start uh, with somebody else. Then. I didn't hear the question, but okay, oh. we can go. go ahead. Well, the question was just how do we help our gardeners succeed, you know, because oh. new gardeners sometimes come in with so much enthusiasm, but no clue about how to do it. So how do we, what sort of education have you created or programs or how do you, you know, how do we take people from the idea of gardening to the reality of gardening? Okay, great. Um, number one, first and foremost, grow what you like. If you don't like eggplant, don't grow eggplant just to grow eggplant because you're going to be highly disappointed when you go to eat it and that plant, that plant keeps producing over and over and over <laughs> all season long. So start small. I, I, I told y'all my, in my case, I had packets of seeds, at least 10. And I put them all in a, a four by four rain bed and I got nothing. Um, and so it's very discouraging, but something said, Hey, you know what? Keep going. Um, do your research, try things. And it actually led me to, to get more informed that I actually um, went through the Georgia Master Gardeners Program, which gave me more tips and more tricks that, I be, that I'm able to use. So start small, you can always expand out. We, we had one four by four bed in the community garden, which became two, which became 10. And now we have these large beds that I think are like two feet long. And so far, I can't remember the actual dynamics at this point in time, but we took baby steps and we grew. We started small and we grew. And, and through that became one tomato, which became two tomatoes, which became five tomatoes, which became um, okra. Okra is a really, really big thing here. So we had Clemson Spinus, we had Burgundy, we had Cowhorn, we had Alabama Red. I had no idea about any of these things years ago. So it's, it's find things that you like, start small, like the plants, keep going and keep growing. That's, that's how I say it. So those are my that's tips. Great. That's so great. Well, you know, and luckily the plants are on our side. They want to grow, you know? So sometimes <laughs> just, you know, that helps a lot too. 
Um, Kali, would you like to talk about education? I know you've got some fun stuff going yeah, on with technology. I, I, I um, Jeffrey, I love that you mentioned that you um, became a master gardener. Congratulations, by the way. Um, I, I took a different, a little bit of a different path. I went the horticultural therapy path to get a certificate in that. So, you know, really talking and focusing on the activity um, and observing the, the behavioral shifts. Um, but, you know, the way that I look at it with veterans and we talk about it is we're here to play with plants, right? Uh, we're not here to observe you. You're not a test subject. We're just here to have a really good time. Um, I think for us, it was involving everyone early. So um, Jeffrey, to your point, you know, grow what you like. So we always have a sheet months ahead of time. What are you thinking about? What do you want? What haven't you been able to get for whatever reason? Let's, let's talk about that. Um, and, and we also pepper in some plants that we know are going to be proven winners, right? Because this is about building confidence and reducing symptoms of depression and isolation. So we are introducing things that we know in our little old seven zone will grow like rock stars. Um, we also, it's not about, uh, we involve them in the organic soil uh, delivery. Uh, we have a composting partner. So these folks actually show up and are part of the education process, talking about what's being delivered, um, you know, and if the veterans can, they are also responsible for putting the soil in the beds. So uh, really understanding, you know, from the minute a plant or a seed is going in, uh, they are involved. So they are accountable. We do, we also offer logs. So we provide um, seed logs to all the veterans and it really becomes almost like a, how are you feeling? How is the seed feeling? Um, and we talk about it. So we're, we're really, I think, bringing this level of, you know, sharing to a new, a new height, uh, but we're doing it through plants. The other piece is that we provide everybody with their own um, gardening kit. So gloves, you know, all, and, and just a few tools and a watering can. Things that people are, that are um, at Edison 64, you know, they don't, they can't afford that stuff. And it's really important if we're going to encourage them to grow that they have the tools they need. So um, that's a part of what we do. And then we are there uh, throughout the growing season at least once a month. Um, but this is a, a community, again, that, you know, if, if you know the veteran community, they don't reach out and ask for help. And our phones are jamming. Like they're calling us to say, when are we getting started? What's happening? Did you order this? Let me tell you, this died. Um, you know, this is going crazy. Can I get another one of these? Um, so to me, that is a success measure because their engagement, even when we're not in the growing season, um, is through the charts. That's great. That's so great to hear. Tamina, how are you um, doing education in your garden? And, you know, there was a question in the chat about how do you maintain a school garden during the summer when school's not going on? So I'm going to throw that out there and then we're going to be able to catch Allison with that one too. But <laughs> just tell us about education first and then tell us about that sort of gap in the middle. For sure. Um, so, yeah, it's really quite a, a beautiful thing because I think a lot of our staff already, all, a lot of our teachers already have their own gardens. And if they don't, they're curious enough to say okay I'll try what is the easiest thing I can grow with my class you know so then we we work things out that way you know we don't we're we try to keep it as simple as we can and then also with localized plants that already we know grow really well with the soil here and um and then we think we talk about a bigger plan so it's also front loading all the teachers with all the information that they need and some of the ideas that they might want to work with, like some classes have, uh, older classes have young buddy classes. So then, the, you know, the big buddies can help the little buddies, you know, and so that's really quite a, a dynamic way of doing it. And then also, what do we do 
in the fall, like once we're harvesting, what do we want to do? One of the main goals that we wanted to do, which we haven't been able to do because of the pandemic, is that um, our people used to cook our food in pit cooks. And we have done a pit cook at our school years ago. Um, and so the idea was like, wouldn't it be cool if we cooked all our food in a pit cook at, and had a school feast? And so that hasn't really been accomplished yet. Hopefully this year that will happen. And, but the other thing that they've been doing is like soup jars. So classes get together and put, it, you know, they put, you know, jar, you know, they make soups and then put it in a jar and they can bring it home. And then also for a lunch program, then kids are getting really um, healthy soup. But also I think we, they've done, last year they did um, tomato sauce. And so, you know, for the lunch program. So then somebody, you know, cooks up a batch of pasta and then puts this tomato sauce on it and the kids get to eat their tomato sauce. So it's a really beautiful program that way. And then yes, for the summer. So there's a lot of things like that going on, which is super great. And for the summer months, that's a really good question. So again, we have a really amazing, um, my, my co-partner, um, she's quite amazing. She, again, she puts stuff out on media and like, hey, I'm gonna go to the garden to, to, you know, on this day and I, you know, does anybody wanna join me? And, you know, she has about four people and that's a good amount for adults, but then they also bring their children too, right? So what a great activity for parents that are trying to keep their kids time filled <laughs> during the summer. So they're also getting an, an experience during the summer months as well. And I just actually want to share, this is what's hilarious. So the mom and I that um, initially, you know, she, we thought of this, he thought of this idea and then I was like, that's a great idea. But both her and I aren't growers. We are not gardeners. I've tried a lot of times in my life and really weird things happen to me when I try to make a garden. Um, one year it looked like it was going to be successful and you know the lettuce was sprouting and um, we have wild horses where I live. He came in and ate all my lettuce and all the tops off of my flowers. And it was like the, I thought it was the first time I was going to grow something I was I was so upset <laughs> so not only the deer you have the wild horses that are against you as well but and this pack bomb as well my 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 buddy here she's like she's the same she's actually like to me I've never successfully grown anything <laughs> we're like great idea <laughs> And she's like, this year's the year, Tanina. And we were talking, and I said, I, I'm like, I don't know if I want to try again. <laughs> well, I think it just goes to prove that it's the community that makes it happen, and not everybody has to know how to do everything or be good at everything. You know, it's asset-based community development. You know, just bringing all the pieces <laughs> together to make your dream happen. Our role is that we're we're bringing people together, and we're bringing the resources that are necessary, and people that have those skills and abilities, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Well, Allison, I'm gonna throw it to you. Tell us a little bit yeah. about education and then uh, tell us about the summer and how you manage that. For sure. So, yeah, so backyard growers, we have our school gardens, we have community gardens, and then we do still have like our, our residents who have a backyard or a porch garden. Um, at the school is the thing we found is to just not have a lot of, crops that require a lot of work in the summer. <laughs> Very simple. Okay. It's like good, really good. the trick. <laughs> so we do a lot of, you know, we're in New England. Um, and so we do the strategic salad days in the spring so that that can be harvested in June, like before the, the kids are out for the year. And then the crops that are growing over the summer months are harvested in the fall. And so there is, you know, there is stuff going on in the gardens, but it's minimal and we're able to rely on our own staff and a reasonable volunteer base and things aren't getting out of hand where you kind of can get community complaints because a lot of times people want gardens to be like really manicured looking yeah, and perfect all the time even if, yeah and even if they're going great you know there's these different expectations right so that's how we manage um that part of it with the school gardens and then in terms of education first i'll speak to like the school gardens and then kind of like the rest of our our community of gardeners um 
in the schools, each grade has a different specific curriculum that ties to those two harvests, that salad days, and then in the fall, um, and it gets, you know, tweaked and developed out by teachers in different ways. So it's a little bit of a different experience each year. It'll be integrated into their science curriculum and that type of thing. We have a full-time garden coordinator who is actually an educator. She has a master's degree in education. She's amazing. And she's really great at working with the teachers, the schools, and the kitchen staff around like utilizing those gardens and making things age appropriate and all of that. With our community gardeners, we do trainings and they're required to come. And we practice square foot gardening, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing too, and keeping it really simple. And a lot of what has already been said here, you know, finding varieties of plants that, you know, are going to do really well in a forest season climate in our specific um, little microclimate that we have here in Gloucester. And so we're really trying to set folks up for success with our immigrant population. There can be a lot of enthusiasm around folks growing things that they grew in their origin country, which is really exciting. And we can kind of work with them to, to take those crops that might be from a different climate and have them grow well in Gloucester, which is a really fun thing because a lot of the times it's food that is unavailable at our local stores here. Um, and then, and to what all of you said, like we want folks growing things that they eat, that they like, you know, if someone has young kids, we're, we're encouraging them to grow things that are, those kids are going to have a good time with, you know, picking in the garden and all of that. And that's where that like, meeting people where they're at comes into play. Um, so we're kind of doing all these different things, but we do have these like required trainings that folks are, you know, required to be at. And we do also have a full-time garden manager who works with folks to help ensure their success. We have a new program um, that's really exciting. It's our grow bag program. And so for folks that for whatever reason, you know, having like a, a fully built backyard garden doesn't make sense for them. Maybe they're landlord doesn't want them to have it. Maybe they are somewhat transient. Maybe they don't have the space. We have these grow bags that folks are using, you know, on their porch or whatever outside space they have, and they're small. And so in that way, we're setting folks up for success because they might just start with one plant and then maybe they add another bag or, you know, another one, but kind of these similar themes of like starting small, meeting people where they're at and just setting them up for success as much as possible. Amazing. Well, you know, it seems like this session just started and it's time for us to wrap because we have the next uh, the next session happening. I want to thank you all for sharing uh, your gardens, opening your hearts and spending your time with us today. I'm sure that it's been really inspiring. I've been monitoring the chat a little bit and people are just blown away by your stories. We've shared all the links for your organization. So if they want to, you know, if they're in your area, they can volunteer. I know we're always open for donations, you know, and sponsors as community gardens. So that information is out there. I want to thank you for that. And again, I would just like to thank Gardening Know How, not only for being our media sponsor for the Great Grow Long, but for having a heart to really care about community gardens and have this grant program and have so many wonderful recipients. And maybe next year when we do the Great Grow Long, we'll get to see another crop of amazing community <laughs> gardens that are, you know, making such a difference in their community. So I thank you all for your time and I look forward to staying connected connected and you know just keep hearing how your gardens are growing and how you're solving these problems and making the world a better place so thank you so much for your time and thanks everybody for participating in today's session we got another one rolling up right after this and enjoy thanks <laughs>